shameless plug, uh, Cervelo is uh, one of my sponsors. Uh, I think I've ridden a number of bikes over the years, and they're, I enjoy the most, it, not just because it's the most recent one I've ridden, it's, uh, I just think it's, it's an awesome bike. The, uh, one of the things with, uh, with the training is uh, the power meter. And I started using a, a power meter a number of years ago. I was probably actually jumped on the bandwagon fairly, fairly early. And uh, I truly believe that it's a tool that if you want to take travel on Earth, even just get, get into it just to help you, it's the, the one tool that if there's going to be anything extra you're going to buy on top of a bike, on top of running shoes, on top of swim goggles, the power meter is probably the next best investment that you can make. It, so what, what is a power meter for those who are confused? So because speed is relative to a whole bunch of stuff, if you're going into a headwind on an uphill, you're going to go way slower. So you might think that 12 kilometers an hour is, is not fast enough, where if you're going downhill with the tailwind, you're going 50 kilometers an hour. So speed is so variant on other inputs that uh, the best way to measure exactly how hard you're working is by measuring how hard you're actually pressing on the pedals. And that's what it does. It comes out with a unit of watts. So like a 100 watt light bulb takes 100 watts of energy to be able to turn on. Where your power meter will tell you, okay, you're pressing on the pedals so 100, 100 watts. Or 200, 300 watts or whatever it is. So and that'll stop you, like, you'll see spikes and your goal is to try to be pretty flat. So. When Sean's had his best rides, he's been really close to 300 watts versus a whole 90 kilometer bike ride. So it, it just forces you to keep the effort that you that you should be keeping, not what you want. So as I said, if you want to go 20 kilometers an hour on a bike ride, if you're going into a headwind up a hill, you're going to get pretty discouraged if you're only going 15 kilometers an hour. Or this, if you know what effort, heart rate kind of works the same way. That if you know you just want to keep 160 heart rate the whole time, going up and down the hill, you just try your best to keep the 160 because every time you go over, it'll make you more tired and deep, deep more. So some of the other aerodynamic things are the aerodynamic helmet. As much as it looks goofy, it's actually it's one of the best bang for your bucks to make you go faster. Um, I have a friend of mine who is a frugal swipe word, right? Where you want to save money. Very cheap. So he, he made a whole spreadsheet of like, what's the cheapest way to make yourself faster? What's the most expensive way to make yourself faster? So it's actually funny and pretty cool, but uh, the aero helmet actually com or combined with aero bars were the cheapest ways to make yourself go faster. Um, uh, and, it, and it works out to a minute over 40 kilometers. So at high level racing, you're, you have to wear one because a minute is a big difference. So if you're anyone who's looking for that extra little bit of advantage, you have to buy a helmet anyways at one point. Although I wouldn't recommend training with them because they get kind of hot. And they look kind of goofy. I might get a few looks at it and try to buy it. Uh, I don't actually have my race wheels on right now, but you can get like carbon fiber aero race wheels to make you more aerodynamic. And uh, the nice tight fitting suits too that you can see. Uh, and that's really the bike. So those bars, if you go back historically about 28 years ago, they were designed by a downhill skier who said, you know, our skiers all get down into this kind of tuck going down the hill, why are bikers like big, you know, flags out there just taking on the sail? And so he designed the bars and the next weekend guys, traffic who used them were, uh, were uh, biking friends who they had never beaten before. That was an indication that maybe something was working. But when they really, really, really took off, for those of you who follow history long enough, in 89 when Greg LeMond won the Tour de France on the last day, the Frenchman had the big ponytail, no helmet, flowing hair, and no bars, and he was leading, and Greg LeMond, I think it was about a minute nine, he took out of him on the very last day to win the Tour de France. And the next week, tons of cyclists who thought this was a goofy thing were buying them for their bicycles. And now, you, everything that you would see that traffic have are on two kinds of bikes. So the, all the cyclists will have them now, from clipless pedals to time trial helmets, whatever. The other place that you're seeing in all the para athletes, para marath the marathoners, they've got the carbon fiber wheels, all the stuff that the triathletes developed. If they work aerodynamically, why wouldn't I use it in my wheelchair or in my time trial bike? And that's, that's happening all around the world. But it's partially because triathletes had nobody to say, you can't do that because there were no rules. We didn't do it. There was nobody three weeks before me. So if I try this and it works, it's good. If I don't, we throw it away. Whereas cyclists had grandparents who rode a bike 89 years ago in Italy and it can't look, it's got to look like this. 
and so it took a very long time to break the culture of recycling. They're actually, uh, at the elite level, they're, they're, these athletes are going into low-speed wind tunnels and actually taking that, you know, that technology that's used to design cars and fighter jet planes, and they're setting themselves up on their bike trainer, they're turning that wind tunnel on, they're actually measuring the coefficient of drag. They're testing things like helmets, like, like John talked about, they're testing their position, they're testing if it's better to have one hand over the top of the other or both hands together. One of the more humorous side of things is a lot of times it's cyclists and triathletes take flack for shaving their legs, especially the men, right? So one of the one of the guys that when he went into the tunnel last week said, well let's see, he's a particularly hairy guy. Um, let's see what happens. And they actually found that pre and post shaving his legs, he saved 12 watts. Which is a significant amount it's of time. A significant amount of time and you extrapolate that over a half Ironman or an Ironman distance. It's huge. So we're always advancing, and triathlon has been known for really pushing, pushing the technology side of things, and uh, shaving legs is not, not too likely. I believe there was an April Fool's joke that came out that said it actually changing the pattern of the, how you shave your legs. <laughs> <laughs> and I, like, the first time I saw him, like, thinking into my head, that could actually possibly be true, and then I'm like, oh wait, there is it, first time. <laughs> Got me. It was funny because I had like a strip of hair right down the middle and the side of the shoes. <laughs> Your shoes? Just a bit of a... Uh, just shoes that, there are a whole bunch of different shoes. There are, there are racing shoes, there are training shoes, there are, well I guess technically there are training shoes, there are lightweight training shoes, and there are racing shoes. So these are more of a, a lightweight training shoe, they're not as light as light can be, but there's a bunch of different levels. So with myself, I go for a long run and wear the shoes that have a bit more support, a bit more padding, just to keep it a little bit easier on my legs. If you're doing something a little bit faster, you want to feel faster, so you have a...